Big tech AI is distinctly different from open source AI, but it doesn't mean that 2024 is any less exciting for massive releases like Gemini 1.5 from Google, Sora from OpenAI, and now Clued 3 from Anthropic AI. Anthropic has basically been the black sheep of big tech AI for some time. Their biggest announcements and their biggest quote advancements have mostly been them claiming that they use AMD Me 3 accelerators for all of their training, claiming that it's just as efficient as doing this with NVIDIA. Clued is good, I just don't know of any people who really use it. Generally, people seem to default to GPT-4 or GPT-4 Turbo, and the question of why you would pay for a premium model here is very valid. Now, Cloud 3 is pretty incredible if we believe the benchmarks that they've provided. It's made up of three different models, Opus, Sonnet, and Haiku. They're claiming this is better than GPT-4 across the board, but with my tests so far and with what I've seen on Twitter from other engineers, I'm willing to question that. And the biggest question is if it's worth the price and if the tokenomics make sense. And no, I don't mean tokenomics in the sense of crypto, even though we've seen a bit of a recovery. So I want to get into how you can use this right now, if it's really worth the cost, how it stands up against other big tech AI models like GPT-4 and Gemini 1.5, where there's some overlap, and really if this is actually worth using. So welcome to AI Flux, let's get into it. So to be frank, I've never been a huge fan of Anthropic AI tools. They've been interesting, but they're sort of like the blue origin of AI. They always seem to ape and lag behind companies that are actually doing things that are impressive. So for instance, Google releases their incredible 1 million context wide window with nearly impeccable needle in the haystack performance. And now Anthropic has just done the same with Cloud3 and they've claimed a few other interesting speed ups around coding that again, both Gemini 1.5 and GPT-4 have claimed. So the question is, why is this better? It's multimodal, just like all the other models. And curiously, it runs into a similar problem of kind of decision paralysis that most people run into when they're thinking of like, what model should I use? And frankly, if I'm being honest, this is why I like perplexity because they give you access to all the APIs anyway. So again, just use perplexity if you're not sure. So how good is this model, at least on the surface? I'm not going to jump into the benchmark examples that I think really outline the big wins and certain pitfalls this model has. But let's go over what Anthropic AI released today. Anthropic AI says today, we're announcing Cloud3, our next generation of AI models. These three state-of-the-art models Cloud3 Opus, Cloud3 Sonnet, and Cloud3 Haiku set new industry benchmarks across reasoning, math, coding, multilingual understanding, and vision. And the benchmarks here are pretty interesting. So they first mentioned MMLU, showing that Cloud3 Opus with a five shot approach, which is the same across all these different models, was able to achieve a higher level of performance than GPT-4, if not just barely. For me, generally speaking, if you're under 1%, 1% in these models, in my opinion, is well within the margin of error in terms of gauging capability. This is something that isn't talked about a lot, and I think it should be talked about more, because as good as these benchmarks are, they change so much week to week or even day to day that it's hard to understand or even quantify what those published margin of errors are. So so to say like it's better if you're within 1% of another model, I think they're valid questions. Now, of course, it's better than GPT 3.5 but there are a number of open source models that also rival GPT 3.5 at this point. And what's also interesting is they're comparing this to Gemini 1.0 Ultra, not 1.5, which I think is kind of interesting because there are actually a lot of big similarities between Cloud3 and Gemini 1.5, predominantly their incredible recall performance with Needle in the Haystack benchmarks and also their massive 1 million token context window. So they're also big on improvements in math problem solving, in grade school math, and graduate level reasoning. The graduate level reasoning bit is really interesting, and I'm going to get to that in just a bit, at least in terms of recalling information in comparison to how professional humans who recall information, you know, academics, can actually do this. Most of the improvement really is in this graduate level reasoning, which I would mostly attribute to the training set. And I'll get to later why I think a lot of this performance pretty much comes down to compute limitations, not necessarily how good the model is, which is kind of curious given what we've seen before. So what are these three models? Uh, so Opus and Sonnet are accessible on their API. And Sonnet is pretty much what you get to use for free. Opus is available only for Cloud Pro subscribers. And supposedly the idea with these three models is sort of a lazy approach to a mixture of experts. So basically saying users can opt for the ideal combination of intelligence, speed, and cost to suit their use case. And cost is a big one because basically speaking, if you're using one of the more capable models here, it's basically two times the cost of GPT-4. 
which begs the question of how much better is this model? Like, is it actually two times better and does it merit that cost? Or are there in certain areas where you might want to use it for multimodal stuff? We'll get into that later. So they claim Opus is the most intelligent model of the three. They say here that it achieves near human comprehension capabilities and can deftly handle open-ended prompts and tackle complex tasks. So these aren't agents yet, but you can prompt it pretty interesting things. And as long as it's happening within the cloud interface, you'll be good. They also say here that it offers sophisticated vision capabilities on par with other leading models. So probably Gemini when they didn't fake the demo. They say the model can, can process a wide range of visual formats, including photos, charts, graphs, and technical diagrams which is pretty cool. Each model shows increased capabilities in analysis and forecasting, nuanced content creation, code generation, and conversation in non-English language. Also a curious thing they say here is that Haiku is the fastest and most cost-effective model, so the smallest, on the market for its intelligence category. For the vast majority of workloads, Sonnet is two times faster than Cloud 2 and Cloud 2.1, while Opus is about the same speed as past models. So the curious thing here is Haiku, in theory, the pricing is good, but I still wonder how they're really measuring this capability, especially against models like Mistral Large, which have proven to be some of the best value in the entire industry. Anthropic seems to be leading the way of Mistral AI, where they say previous cloud models often made unnecessary refusals. So pretty much censoring more information and being too careful. They say here, we've made meaningful progress in this area. Cloud three models are significantly less likely to refuse to answer prompts that border on the system's guardrails, which I have not found this to be the case, but we'll do a little bit more testing in just a bit. And they dig a little bit deeper into this saying, the cloud three model family has advanced on key measures of biological knowledge, cyber related knowledge and autonomy compared to previous models, but it remains AI safety level two as per our responsible scaling policy. So pretty much it says it's not gonna tell you how to create bio weapons or manage to break into a firewall. So they're excited to see what people make with it. Elon said he was impressed and then Lambda offered them more compute, which is very on brand for Anthropic. So their blog post offers a bit more information here and they pretty much show their cost scaling notion here so that Haiku is the cheapest, Sonnet is right in the middle, right at about their previous price point, and then Opus is the highest. So generally speaking, when we see pricing like this, it means that there is a limitation on inference, at least in terms of how many GPUs they can afford to host. Now, the curious thing is if we'll see this actually end up on a Grok accelerator, we'll just have to wait and see if that happens. So what I wanted to talk about here was this GPQA benchmark which is basically a way of measuring how adept at recalling certain kinds of complex information a model is. So what's cool with this is this basically compares the accuracy of these models to actual PhDs and experts in their field, some of which who have access to the internet and some of whom don't. So the curious question here is, you know, at what point is a model like this actually better than a human who is professionally trained in that area of knowledge or skills. And the context window is what this comes down to. So right now on launch, you only get a 200,000 token context window. And eventually all three models will be capable of taking inputs of up to 1 million tokens, which is pretty cool, especially since Google on the lower end only opens up that 1 million context window to the highest end version of Gemini 1.5. And the needle in a haystack evaluation also is pretty incredible here because Cloud3 Opus not only achieved a near perfect recall, surpassing 99% accuracy, but in some cases even identified the limitations of the evaluation itself, which is pretty cool. Now, David Rain made a really good point with GPQA, and this came from breaking down the actual paper that was released, further outlining uh, the performance of this model. So. Cloud3 gets 60% accuracy on GPQA, and without knowing what humans can get, it's actually kind of a meaningless number. But what's crazy is that generally, uh, PD PhDs in different domains from the questions asked, generally tend to get 34% even with access to the internet, which is pretty crazy. So, so that's how hard these questions really are. They're really, really hard, and if I had to go back and remember a lot of the high-end uh, dynamics classes I took in college, I would probably not score this high. Yeah, so what's crazy is PhDs in the same domain, also with internet access, get 65 to 75% accuracy. And those are the absolute best in their fields and arguably like savant level intelligent people. So there's a question of how this was actually measured. I think it shows how powerful scaling really is. And we'll see if 
academics can remain uh, at the top of their field for the next few years. And what's interesting is from Anthropic's own reporting, they pretty much say that we could have made it better, but it was just too expensive to do and wouldn't have made any money in terms of training. So there were actually instances of this being better, but the funny thing is uh, each evaluation rollout was more expensive than, than the next. And when you're training on transformers, the scaling of this is not linear, it's actually exponential. So to get the next big improvement in performance would mean you'd have to spend not basically an exponential amount more to reach that next level of performance, which is why um, RNNs uh, like RQKV are so interesting because they scale linearly. So how much do these models actually cost and how much does GPT-4 cost? So for their highest end model, basically for input, it's $15 per million tokens, and for output, it is $75 per million tokens, which this is frankly the highest number I've ever seen for a closed source model. That's kind of crazy. Uh, basically, Sonnet, which is their kind of value offering, is $3 per input million tokens and $15 per output million tokens. And then obviously Haiku is pretty dirt cheap um, on par with some of the mid-tier Mistral models. Now the question is, how much would that equivalent model cost for GPT-4 or GPT-4 Turbo? And this is when it gets kind of interesting. So this is the direct comparison for GPT-4 Turbo. And for comparison, it's less than half the cost. So it's $30 per million tokens output and $10 per million tokens input. Obviously output is more expensive than input because you can have a variable length for what you're getting. and for me, this is really where the real question crops up, which is, is it actually better? Where does it break? And if it is breaking, like, I mean, what are you even really paying for? So one of the better examples of this breaking is what engineers now refer to as the shirt drying query. So basically what this is, is a query of asking, if three shirts take one hour to dry outside, how long would 33 take? So when asked this question, if three shirts take one hour to dry outside, how long would 33 shirts take? This is a pretty simple problem for humans, but for LLMs, it's a little bit harder. And the irony is GPT-4 Turbo Previews, the lowest end version, gives you a very suitable answer. It says, yeah, like there, you can dry more shirts in the same place, or if you have to do it uh, synchronously, you know, it's gonna take a little while. And the hilarious thing is Cloud3 Opus. So the best model of these three actually gives you completely the wrong answer. And just says, yeah, if three shirts take one hour to dry, then 33 shirts would take 11 hours to dry. And we, it gives you an equation, so it's, it's trying to do some math. But the question here, uh, as Anton says, is, is it too smart for its own good? And the irony is even after giving it a bit more context, it actually still got it wrong, which is kind of hilarious. So there's a real question of how capable is this and how kind of creative in problem solving is this model. Now, of course, some people managed to add further instruction and they eventually got it there. But when you're using a model that is $75 per million tokens of output, you don't really want to mess with this. I mean, this is a thing that Mistral handily passes. It's just a, it's a very curious shortfall of the model. And the other thing is, although they've claimed that it actually is not as censored as prior models, it's it's really still pretty censored. And in, in terms of its fair uses and in terms of what it will let you ask, the other irony is technically you can't use this for employment. So the question is, what other things can you use it for? So they basically say you can't use it as something you generate at work. You can't use it to find employment. And this is all kind of wrapped up in their ability to provide this model. And the irony is they say, if you end up uh, violating this, so if they think you're using it for work, which tons of people use GPT-4 for work, they said that they might actually just terminate your user's cloud access, um, which is, Making these things great don't actually make them better, and I don't think they really help the user understand, or people using these models, understand what they can and can't do. Which, for me, I think is kind of regressive and not a step forward. So I want to show a few more quick questions here. Of course, this is using Sonnet, not Opus, since I have not subscribed to Pro yet. But let me see what I can do here. So I've done, what is 5 plus Blive? It got it. I asked for some directions to make seed oil free bread. It gave me a basic Python function to actually figure out how I would do that, which was pretty cool. And let me start a new one here and see what we can do. 
So I'm gonna try asking Sonnet sort of a similar shirt drying question and we'll see how it does. So um, it already kind of failed in my question for asking sort of a binary version of the shirt question, which was, will I need to dry my shirt based on the following premise? I pretty much said I was at the beach wearing a shirt and asking when I would need to. So basically the idea here is if I'm at the beach and I don't go in the water, I don't need to dry my shirt. And I was asking it what I would need to do to necessitate drying the shirt, which would be going in the water. And even with added context after about three different prompts, it still failed to give me an answer. So what I'm going to ask here is if I have three shirts that have been washed and need to dry, can I dry more of them parallel in the sun or should I use a... So basically the point here is if I can dry three shirts at a time in the sun, they'll dry faster than if I can put nine shirts under a shaded structure. So the, ask, the question here is, does it, does it understand that the sun dries things faster that are wet? And we'll see. So what's interesting is the key thing to get here is speed and it's all hung up on airflow and it's more concerned about kind of fabric damage as well even though I clearly emphasized that I wanted to dry more shirts in less time and that how they got wet or how they would dry relative to the shirt being affected isn't really my concern. So let me ask here. I want to dry as many shirts as fast as possible. And we'll see if it actually gives us something. Okay, so now we gave it there. So now it's just saying, just use a rack. Uh, ensure good airflow. So again, it's it's totally missing the initial bit. And so finally, it says, while drying the sunlight is fastest, be aware that extended UV. Okay, I don't care. And see, what's funny is it still misses this because I told the model there were restrictions on where I had the actual racks. And now it's saying use small racks or strategically positioned in the sun where it's missing the fact that I have larger racks in shade and one smaller rack in the sun. So this is kind of disappointing. Uh, it's not their most advanced model, but we have to wonder what's going on here. Um, so now I'm going to ask uh, where temperature in Europe been recorded? What is the term? So for those of you who don't know, there are actually areas where there are small depressions in mountains that pool cold air where they actually can't actually seek out. And I wanted to see where this is. And so I actually missed this, it didn't get this. They are not in glacial areas. They're not in these kind of frost heaving areas. So I figured since its recall is so good, it would understand this since this is kind of a slightly more niche advanced geology question. Okay, so you know, honestly, I'm not that impressed. It's time to react is a bit faster, but I'm not really seeing that it's, its answers just aren't very concise. And it's curious that Mistral has actually tried to maximize how concise their models are. And especially when you're paying what you are to use these models, the reason you're doing it is so you don't have to reprompt or add more context because that's inherently kind of a hard thing to do especially if we're setting these up to use agents. And I think it's pretty clear that the next big step for big tech AI um, is agents and are actually architectures that don't rely as heavily on black box transformers and that rely on more of a nuanced agent architecture when it comes to splitting up what skills individual model components are good at and how they solve problems. So I'm curious what you guys think about this. Uh, you can already use Sonnet for free, so I'll link below so you can do that. I'm not sure if I would really wanna pay for this API. I'm waiting to see if they actually have this show up on Perplexity, although I'm sure Perplexity would have to adjust their pricing to allow a $75 per million token model to actually be hosted there. So again, let me know what you think in the comments. As always, I hope you learned something in this video. If you did, um, please like, subscribe, and share. It helps us out a ton, and we'll see you in the next one.